and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Dr. Justin James Kennedy, who is all the way over in Hamburg in Germany. How are you doing, Justin? Hello, John. Good to be here. Um, looking forward to the time together. Absolutely. And, uh, and Justin's a TEDx speaker, author, neuroscientist, executive coach, talent expert, performance and wellness consultant. And in his spare time, well, no, he doesn't have any spare time. You're doing that many <laughs> things. <laughs> um, so what we want to talk about today is, um, is your book. But first of all, what I want to do is lay some of the groundwork here. And just like you know, most people in life, your path to where you are today is a, a, a meandering and sometimes surprising one. Um, so let's talk about probably the, the pivotal experience that you had was when you were working in South Africa and you had this uh, terrible accident on a, on a Vespa. Just, just to explain that to the audience a little bit, because that'll shape the rest of our conversation. Thanks, John. Well, if I have to tell the story it would be much better if you read the book so um everybody um save your money and listen to the story quickly John. <laughs> so the the story is that i was working in south africa um one day i rode home um on a motorbike thinking i was all very cool wearing my my little vespa helmet and the thing wasn't very strong um, a driver and his car came out of nowhere and the next thing i was flying through the sky like a like in a gymnast, gymnast or a circus acrobat, landed on my head, went into a coma, and that was bad enough. But the recovery process was even more difficult, John, learning to walk and talk and really to control my emotional well-being, which really sparked my interest in learning more about neuroscience. Yeah. So, so then, so then you got introduced to, to neuroscience and then the, the book that you uh, the book is all about how you can, as you said, how you can manipulate the way your brain automatically and immediately triggers an emotional response to a situation. Um, so just tell me the process about how you discovered this and how you learned, uh, you know, how you can actually start to manipulate your brain. Well, the, the manipulation is about training your brain to change your mind so that you can heal your heart and feel emotionally in control. So, John, the, the process is first about building your self-awareness and then having the tools to uh, influence or manipulate um, the, the thinking that's happening and more importantly, the behavior that follows because we need to be uh, focusing on our behavior change because that's what is observable by others. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing is uh, self-awareness, right? For me, for me, self-awareness is mm -hmm. the greatest gift that you can give yourself. It's the greatest gift. And it's something that you have to do on your own. It's very hard to do. Other people mm -hmm. can't give you self-awareness. You have to develop it yourself. Um, and as I said, it's the greatest gift you can give to yourself, but it requires a certain amount of you know you have to do some self-discovery you have to be mm. humble you have to accept things mm. maybe you have to learn things about yourself that maybe you don't want to learn so let's just talk a little bit about your journey of self-awareness the 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 uh, let me try and think as i st stutter trying to find the words remembering all those traumatic memories um the first thing was about to find my balance and start to walk and talk again, um, which was difficult enough, but it was very easy in comparison to try and control my emotional well-being because I went from depressed to angry to irritated all over the place. And a key word that I learned and often spend time in my coaching practice, teaching people about the benefits of discipline and Self-awareness is vital, as you rightly said, and when you notice the power of discipline in changing things that you now are more aware of, it becomes a very valuable journey, John. So that is a very useful um, insight that I had. 
Yeah, and and I think that's uh, I think that's a, a great point because in some ways discipline, mm. uh, discipline, hard work, uh, uh, applying yourself to things. Unfortunately, these are these seem to be traits or, or something that are kind of downplayed nowadays. We live in this world where everything is a quick fix and a shortcut and everything oh, like right. that. But nothing. But if we even take your journey as an analogy, right? I mean, nothing happens quickly without and, and nothing happens quickly to begin with and nothing happens without dedication and hard work mm. it's it's unfortunate we live in a in an environment with social media and electronic uh uh feedback uh, which is so immediate but you know it's very difficult to make sustainable change without having the discipline and what what i learned what was very useful John, is that about making big changes, it's really important to make small changes mm -hmm. so that you can build a momentum. And, and that has a very big effect on the reward pathway in the brain. And if you start building on that and getting that dopamine kick or that dopamine release, you know, then you then build a momentum of motivation and the discipline becomes a bit easier as you proceed. But then, you know, starting is a trick and then sustaining the motivation is, a, is, a, is important. I mean, like from eating to exercise to everything else, you know, you need to start somewhere and making that first point of entry pretty easy or pretty, pretty small so you don't feel like you're taking on a marathon on the first day. Yeah, and I think, uh, I think that's always a great point is it's good to have big goals, but you also have to be realistic about how to get to those goals. I, 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 uh, I interviewed a, a gentleman a, a while back who nice. told me that he, um, he decided that he wanted to run a marathon. Now, at the time he decided mm -hmm. he wanted to run a marathon, he was heavily overweight. He never exercised. Um, right. He wasn't very healthy. So what he did was he decided he wanted to run a marathon. And the first day, he got up the first day, mm -hmm. he, walked, he walked for five minutes. That's it. He walked for five minutes Brilliant. and then he increased that a little bit over time. And sure enough, now, you know, then he ran marathons and all of that. But he didn't go out the first day and try and run the 20, whatever it is, Very six good. miles. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's about challenging yourself just enough so that you are motivated to do it again. So it's just mm -hmm. pushing the boundaries a little bit. Um, big goals, small steps. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the interesting things here, uh, and I think this is this is a, a huge part of the journey to self-awareness and something mm -hmm. you talk about is the concept of, of triggers. Right. Um, we all have triggers. If you don't if you don't start to recognize and learn your triggers, they can really, really derail, uh, mm -hmm. derail many situations for you and hold you back. Yeah, the, the, the model of triggers that I explore in the book is about how your brain is rigged to have a neurotic or an emotional anxious response. Well, that, that's the kind of thing that keeps you out of the way of danger if you're living in a you know, prehistoric environment. And unfortunately that unconscious or pre-conscious behavior, the way that our brain is rigged to be triggered emotionally is something that we need to be more aware of and as you mentioned self-awareness is the key so as you become more aware of this emotional trigger you can then start to notice how your behavior is rigged to unnecessarily cause you an emotional outburst so what i say to people at this point in the in the process john i say it's very important to notice the difference between an emotion and a feeling and um, often, did we discuss this before? I can't remember between the difference of an emotion and feeling, did we? Um, no. So let's let's uh, review that for everybody because I'm sure okay. there's lots of people out there who who don't know the difference. Well, I mean, everyone knows the difference, if not just the spelling. But yeah. uh, but there there is a difference neuropsychologically, and. An emotion is a neurological event. It's something that goes off unconsciously. It happens when you uh, swerve the car to miss the toddler in the street, or you know you um, have some stressful event go off. So there's a there's a reflex. So your brain is rigged to have that kind of response. 
And the feeling is something that happens when we become conscious. I feel stressed by that event. I feel out of control. Or I feel happy. And the key point is about finding that control. And that comes out of that self-awareness we were speaking about, John. Yeah, yeah, no, because it is, um, if you think about it, um, what is it that derails people the most, actually, is is emotional, not being able to control emotional mm. responses, right? And mm. if there's one thing that you, you'll often hear people, if they're being really honest sometimes, and mm. ourselves, where we go later on, where we reflect, and go, uh, I wish I hadn't reacted like that. Mm. Um, so the key then is obviously how you start to control that a little bit better or replace that reaction mm. a little bit better. I mean, that reaction is always an emotional trigger. Mm. It's it's never like some calculated plan. Maybe there is some uh, there, there's some evil genius out there, but it's normally driven by some kind of emotional response. But that emotional trigger does influence the way we think and perceive and obviously behave. So that then becomes a whole process around how we show up psychologically. And these emotions have such an influence on how we think and behave, John. So it becomes a waterfall uh, of problems in the wrong direction. Well, it, it, it does. And and I think the other thing about triggers and emotions that uh, that is really important for people to, mm -hmm. to, to think about is often your triggers are rooted in things that are totally unconnected with where you are today, mm -hmm. right? Maybe they're rooted mm -hmm. in things from the past. And recognizing those triggers is incredibly important because you may you may be mm -hmm. sitting in one of the most important meetings of your life or whatever it is, and then somebody says something or looks at you in a certain way and it, mm -hmm. it connects with you, it triggers and it says, oh my goodness, that's the way somebody in my, you know, that's the way my dad used to look at me when he was mad oh, at me or right. whatever, whatever. And that person may just, you know, maybe just looking out the window, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to recognize that because suddenly that can take you from that place you are to somewhere completely different and derail exactly. everything. Exactly. And there's, there's a good story that I have around this, around a client who was uh, narcoleptic. So that is someone who falls asleep often more so than they would like to. Mm -hmm. And she was speaking to me and saying, you know, she can't, she can't control this need to sleep. And she was on the way to speak to a sleep specialist, which is obviously a very good idea <laughs> if you're a narcoleptic. And I said, you know, let's just think about what are the triggers that make you want to sleep the whole time. And, you know, it took a bit of a while, but it basically comes down to what stresses her out. So exhausting activities make her want to sleep. And most of us would like to have a nap and we feel <laughs> exhausted. But her response was, so overwhelming that she would have to just leave meetings and you know just got lied down with the head at her desk um and you know in the process we thought you know okay so it's a stress response fair enough but what is the trigger of that type of response to that stress and in the in the dialogue john we 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 found that she didn't know the origin but she knew that the origin existed before she could remember mm. based on the relationship she had with her sister. Okay. So when she was a toddler, she had an older sister. Well, she still has an older sister today, but when she was a toddler, she was very used to doing things that her older sister wanted as many younger siblings do. Mm. So she was very motivated to be like her older sister, help her sister, give of herself, you know, whatever her older sister needed. And what happened is she learned that behavior of being overly giving to others, which is a, a very nice thing to be giving, but it's not so good when you overgive to the point of exhaustion. So her narcolepsy was related to her unconscious trigger to be overly giving to people. So her stress was kind of self-induced by her unconscious pattern of thinking. And that was very stressfully emotional because she didn't know what was how to control it. And out of the process, we started 
helping her become more assertive and more directive of her own behavior rather than being so overly giving, if that's a useful story, John. No, that's a fantastic story uh, because I, I think, again, it really underlines the fact that a lot of the things that impact our lives today, as, mm. you, as you pointed out in this story, are rooted in things from our past. And, mm. and it's not like we all have to sort of spend hours sitting on, uh, you know, sitting on a psychiatrist's couch or whatever. Exactly. Although, to be honest, not the worst thing in the world you could do. Um, <laughs> and I think, to be honest, uh, and probably a lot more people could do with doing that. Um, but it does mean that if you spend a little time on that self-awareness journey of like thinking back and trying to make connections and wondering, why do I, why do I react like that when I'm in a particular situation? Mm. And often people don't know. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, often it's would... impossible to know. I mean, often, often um, psychotherapy, like um, Freud and analysis, you know, end up your whole time uh, trying to make peace with things you can't ever understand. <laughs> And there's okay. some benefit just being uh, just being heard, of course. So, what I find in the self-awareness journey is finding out just enough. And right. what I mean about finding out just enough, it's finding out just enough to motivate and sustain behavior change, so you don't get tripped up by your triggers, so that you can reboot your brain and change your mind, so that you are in control and. You know, that, that kind of control is so valuable because you feel good. That's which is the most important thing. And when you feel good, that behavior tends to be, you know, self-motivating, which is the big trick, isn't it? No, absolutely. Absolutely. So when we're talking about, um, you know, your book, Reboot Your Brain and the whole concept, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, talk to me a little bit about the, the concept of neuroplasticity. So in the work, um, that's a really interesting uh, question, John. So the concept in my work speaks around neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, and neuroeconomics. Okay. Mm. So let me just let me just go off for a bit and tell you about about, yeah, about this. So neuroplasticity shows us that the brain has the flexibility under certain conditions to be flexible. So as you know, if you don't exercise your body, you don't get very flexible. But if you exercise and you stretch it out, you know, you can be more flexible. So in the same way, if you practice certain uh, neuropsychological tasks, you can become more flexible. A good example of this is a study done in London with taxi drivers. And I don't know if you've been to London, John, but the oh, many, many, many times, you know, but but the the street system is a complete chaotic system. I mean, I don't know how they ever got that right. Maybe from the Romans and the and the floods, and it just got into a complete mess. So, the well, the, tax, I, I, the you 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 lived in Ireland, so you know Dublin yeah, yes. maybe on a smaller scale, but just yeah, as but, messy. But that's what exactly. happens when you have a thousand-year-old city. <laughs> You know, when, when, when it gets old and complicated, it gets messy. And same with the brain. So what, what the study did from the University of London, it looked at the taxi driver's brains and what, what might be different in their brains by having this ability to get around all these crazy little avenues and lanes. And what they found is that by these taxi drivers building new pathways in their brains by knowing the, the roads and the paths and the lanes through London, they had built more plasticity in their hippocampus, which is an area um, involved in the memory and the learning. So taxi drivers in London have better memory and learning skills than you and me, John. <laughs> well, at least in terms of getting around London, okay? Yeah. So that the learning has to be context specific. So what the neuroplasticity shows that your learning needs to be context specific. And if you facilitate that learning on a regular basis, you actually get into a place of neurogenesis, um, which shows the rebirth of new brain cells. So you yeah. can actually build your brain bigger by learning. So that's some good news for us who've had brain damage that we can actually build our brain backs one neuron at a time. But an important part of the work that I do is that around neuroeconomics. So once you've kind of started building your brain back again, or at least starting to have some flexibility in your learning and thinking, 
You then get into an interesting area of research, John, which is called neuroeconomics. And that shows that the brain is designed to be irrational, which comes back down to the emotional discussion because the brain doesn't know that it's thinking. It just does thinking as a byproduct. And what happens when we're thinking, our thinking isn't clean like a surgeon's table. It is, it is messy with emotions and previous experiences and opinions and bias and just everything else that we um, have an opinion about. And neuroeconomics shows us that we have limited capacity to notice how our thinking is being influenced. So uh, well, one example, if I, if I can play with you, John, is, mm -hmm. is an example of the pen and pencil test. Okay. Right. Okay. So imagine that you have a pen and a pencil, I'll give you a gift. Very, very, very fancy. I don't know what's that fancy brand. Anyway, it doesn't matter what the brand is. Oh, Mont Blanc. Yes, Mont Blanc. <laughs> so I've given you a Mont Blanc pen and pencil set. And uh, the, the set costs $110, okay? Uh -huh. And I tell you that the, in the set, there's a pen and a pencil, and the pen costs $100 more than the pencil. But they together they cost 110, and then I ask you what does the pen cost? And most people think, okay, the pen costs 100 dollars more than the pencil. Together they cost 110. Therefore, the pencil must cost. Most people think, well, it must cost 10. And if I tell you that the the pencil isn't 10. People said, well, that's a bit confusing. How does that actually process? And the reason people get stuck on that because our simple uh, learning in mathematics doesn't give us the, the meta thinking about our thinking. But not that our mass training is necessarily bad, mm -hmm. but because there's a word more in the sentence, it confuses our brains. So we tend to assume that the pen costs 100, not 100 more. Mm -hmm. um, so if you take the, if you take the 100 uh, for the pen and you put it aside and you've only got 10 left between the pencil and the pen, and if the pen is $100 more, you then have to split the 10 between the pen and the pencil, leaving the price of the pencil to be five. Did you follow? Did you follow the yeah, street, yeah, yeah, John? Yeah, yeah, Does that make yeah. sense? So you know yeah. that that's an example of neuroeconomics showing how the brain makes simple errors based on our previous experience and our and our ability or our inability to jump to conclusions because we think we understand things. Yeah, it's and no, it's such it's such an interesting concept. And as you said, I um, mean, it's so interesting when you say like our brains are basically um, set up to be irrational. And I think that's a pretty mm. good explanation for the world we live in today. Right. Um, obviously, that's come to the fore, and we need to mm. um, spend more time maybe training our brains. Um, but it's a it's it's a it's a really interesting it's a really interesting thought to think about that when you are in a given situation that your brain may be feeding you erroneous information mm. because and that you have to you have to dig behind it. I mean, it, it's all impossible actually. The whole idea of free will is a myth, but anyway, that's a whole discussion on philosophy <laughs> for another time. But we're influenced and biased by our opinions. Um, another quick story that might be relevant to to your work, John, um, is that I've done a lot of work uh, recently with coaches and consultants, showing them how to use their brains so that they can win over new clients. And what they have found is that when they are skilled at coaching, they tend to start coaching when they should still be in the sales process. So, you know, it's like a, a carpenter uses a hammer for everything. Um, mm. You know, an electrician uses a screwdriver for everything, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what we found in the Brain Hack project um, is that there is a skill set where you can school yourself to be in a different headspace rather than just going into the usual space, the, 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 
the default where your where your bias is normally based. So how do you do? How, how, what's that process look like for people who are, who are who are watching? So if you're so you have a normal mode of thinking, you have a normal way of reacting to things, you have a normal way of processing things. How do you then start to say, okay, well, maybe there's a different way of looking at this? Well, the first way is to bump your head, not necessarily into going to a coma, <clears throat> but you have to have a you have to have a thing that you want to change. You know, you want to lose weight or you want a new job or you want to get married or I don't know, whatever you want to do. So you need to find a thing that you want to address. So without the need for change, there's nothing going to happen. Mm -hmm. And once you have an item that you want to address, you then need to make sure that you have a motivation. And there's push and there's pull, there's good and there's bad, there's hard and there's soft. And negative motivation is always more effective. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's more yeah. effective. Um, but it's not as fun. It's not as nice as to, you know, to run away from the, the banker than it is to buy a new car or phone or whatever. So it's useful to balance the both, to have a push and a pull so that your emotional reward of dopamine becomes excited, but also, you know, the, the stress of failure is embedded. So building that relationship. And then, as I said before, it's about building systems of sustainability. You were speaking about your friend who went to run a marathon by starting to walk and, you know, putting those little instruments, those little steps in place so that you can remember, which will then reinforce the process. And then what happens there is a, there's an unconscious change that happens, John, is that you start getting into the routine. Um, I've been noticing that I need to be keeping my body flexible, flexible. Um, and, you know, doing yoga is a bit boring, actually, and I didn't really enjoy it. But, you know, I started challenging myself to see if I can do things more. So putting the little challenges in place motivated me to do something positive. I didn't have to say, oh, God, this is so boring. And, you know, now it's become a habit. Now I actually look forward to it. So in the same way with diet or studies or whatever you can you can build the same sequence of tricking your brain to to be doing things in your own best interest yeah no i i, I agree i'm i'm martial arts is my my oh, very passion, good. my past my pastime and actually just to your point is um recently i i started this whole this this stretching program to try and even at my age to try mm. and achieve uh, front and side splits right and it's it's um, as you know, stretching is not the most interesting or exciting thing in the world. You don't mm. get up in the morning and go, "Oh, I can't wait to do my stretching routine today." <laughs> um, exactly. But but the more you get it, the more you start to see results. The more you you know stay with something or whatever, mm. then it brings its own level of pleasure. And I think that's probably uh, something that. Unfortunately, as I said, again, the world we live in today is that, you know, this instant gratification thing. I think when people realize that, you know, gratification comes over time by achieving results and you can't have it instantly. Right. I think there's they're happier people rather than people who think that everything has to happen now immediately. Mm. Well, I mean, we all want instant gratification. I mean, of course, that's the that's the mm. way we design. Nobody wants to have to wait for stuff. However, <laughs> If we have to work at getting something, we add more value to it. So if we're just given, um, you know, a million dollars, we don't tend to unconsciously, at least, value it as much as if we had earned it. Um, in fact, there's a very sad study showing that if you win a million dollars in the lottery or whatever the amount, the likelihood of you becoming depressed is higher than if you didn't win the, the million dollars. So it's, it's pretty depressing to win money. So don't play the lottery, rather go and earn the money. Yeah. And in fact, I think uh, the chances of you not only coming depressed, but actually ended up poorer than you were before mm. you won the lottery is also yeah. quite high. And, you know, and losing lots of friends on the way. So you can just imagine <laughs> the, the downside of winning a lottery. It's yeah. a very funny yeah. story, isn't it? Yeah, that would make a great commercial for the lottery, wouldn't it? Yeah, Win the lottery, <laughs> become depressed, lose your friends and end up broke. <laughs> oh. um, one other thing oh. I just wanted to come back to again, just to reiterate on this point about 
um, putting in the effort? Because you you said about the London taxi drivers, right? And just mm-hmm. for people who aren't aware, um, um, because they probably people think, oh, well, you got sat nav and all that kind of stuff today and mm-hmm. the GPS. Mm-hmm. However, um, uh, the London taxi drivers is a thing called the knowledge. And mm. to become a London taxi driver, to get a license, you have to pass a test called the knowledge. And what the knowledge is, is, is that you would go to the test and the tester will give you all these destinations and you have to, off the top of your head, tell them the fastest route, route to it, an alternative route if there's traffic and all that. So to become a London taxi driver, you have to spend months and months and months. Literally back in the day, they used to go around on on uh, scooters and motorbikes mm. with a with a map learning all of the routes so oh. they can achieve all of that and they can get that neuroplasticity and all of that and they can increase their brain per- but it comes from putting the hard work in it does unfortunately that's the you know the secret is there is no streak secret you know you've got to mm-hmm. just get up and if you want to get fit you've got to go and you know, change your diet and your behavior and your stress and your exercise regime. So, um, but the the good news is that it can be enjoyable. And, you know, like yourself, you know, there is uh, um, a joy that you have in the relationship with, with karate. There's a, there's a, there's a joy in the exercise. Um, and if you're sitting on the couch eating pizza and drinking beer, you know, the idea of going to exercise is the worst thing that you can imagine. But if you get into it, the pizza and beer becomes less attractive so that you can kind of do things to trick yourself into doing things that you want versus what you need. And I always say to people, have you thought of the difference between what you want and what you need? And we don't want what we need and we do need what we want. So we get like in this whole conundrum, not only linguistically, but psychologically. Because if you find out what really you need, then your wants become less and less attractive. So when you start wanting what you need, then you've got it. Then you've got it, John. Then you've got everything yeah. solved. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, and a great place mm. to, to end today. So the book is called Reboot Your Brain. Uh, and it's available when? It's available last year and it's Brain Reboot. But um, I mean, people can get it from my website. I don't know if you can put my website on here, John. But, um, but um, it's, a, it's a useful book just to help you learn some of the strategies and the ways you can control your triggers. But, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is obvious, but some of the tools are not always obvious. Yeah, and there we have the the website. It's professor. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, And so um, this has been a fantastic interview. I think this is such an interesting subject area. I really would encourage people to go to uh, Professor Kennedy's um, website and check out check out the book check out. uh, You have a you have a brain test here also that people can uh, can take. it's, It's a very it's a very interesting test in the sense that it takes a couple of minutes to do. I mean, it's very quick. Mm -hmm. But the research from Harvard shows that if you fail this test, there's a very good chance of you having cardiac disease. And in fact, even a a cardiac arrest. So based on your personality style, there is a good chance, one out of four, in fact, that you run the risk of cardiac disease if you fail this test. So if that is enough negative emotion for make people want to uh, train their brain, then maybe that's a good way to get the people involved, John. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, again, the website is Professor Kennedy. Dot com. All of uh, all of Professor Kennedy's information will be below this video, um, so you'll be able to contact him. Um, and just before we go, uh, do you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself? Well, I mean, I think I think the the main reason I was e- I was eager to speak to you in the in the the sales pipeline environment was to speak to people who are interested in the sales environment, and. I've been working a lot and looking at the neuroscience of sales and showing people how they can train their brain to change their mind to get more sales and win over more clients. So as a result, I did some of the research and it was actually quite fun to look at what needs to be in place to cause 
more sales to happen. So I put together a, a course and it's a self-directed course and it's quite a lot of fun, lots of games and activities in it. And for your, for your listeners, I'm happy to give them um, a discount on that, John, if they want to do the course. It's called the Brain Hack Project and it's all very fun and it's all very self-directed, but there are also uh, group discussions and individual sessions with me. So that might be something for people in the sales environment to learn how they can train their brain to get more results and win over more clients. So that's been lots of fun recently, John, showing people how to win over new clients. And it's quite fun. And as you probably know, there's a huge rush, there's a huge reward when you make the sale. And mm -hmm. that that feeling is something that you can you can trigger in your brain and you can get that feeling before you make the sale so that it motivates behavior to get more sales therefore you get more sales so um so that's a bit of like the like the marathon runner learning to go for a walk and yeah. put on his shoes and take it step by step so that's something that um i'm happy to offer the 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 community here um and offer them a 50 percent discount on the course it's wow. good fun and i hope we can do it john and maybe maybe i can convince you to do it too yeah, 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 maybe. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah. I'd definitely encourage people to go check it out. Um, as you can tell, like a uh, fascinating, you know, background here and fascinating information. And I think, uh, you know, given given the world we live in today, I think you need to give yourself every edge and competitive edge mm. you can. So I would really encourage people to go check it out. Mm. Listen, Professor Kennedy, this has been fantastic. Um, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Mm, thank um, you. Yeah, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.